Father, thank you that we could be gathered here. Lord, be with us now as we look at this text that over the next uh, however many weeks this series goes is going to be challenging to us and convicting. But Lord, may it be clear. Help us now, Lord, to be able to leave behind whatever we've brought with us this week, uh, whether that's our brokenness or our pride or Father, even if it's our affliction or some sort of suffering, not that we would leave it behind, but that we would be willing to listen to what your word says to us in the midst of it. Be with us, Lord, in your name. Amen. So we're going to be starting a series on a book of the New Testament that I don't really like, if I'm being completely honest. Uh, Not that I don't wish it was scripture. Uh, I just don't really care for it. And I'm not alone. Maybe you've heard of a guy named Martin Luther. If you're not familiar with Martin Luther, he was a priest at the end of the 15th, turn of the 16th century, and uh, largely credited with beginning the Protestant Reformation. And what he did was he went and he tacked these 95 statements, or what we call 95 theses, onto the, jo- onto the door of the cathedral wall, of, uh, or the cathedral door, of Wittenberg, Germany. And his primary interest was really in reforming the Roman Catholicism of the day because what he saw was that the Catholic Church at that time was teaching really what was a merit based salvation. So, in other words, you know, to really simplify, the more good you did, right, the more likely you were to get into heaven, the more bad you did, the more likely you were to go to hell. And so you kind of wanted to tip the scales in your favor, you know, do more good than bad. And that was primarily evident through this system called indulgences, where an indulgence was something that you could buy from the Roman Catholic Church, and then it would allow you to indulge in sin, right? Like it was a way of buying, it was like carbon credits for your sin. You know, you could go like basically buy some sins back by going and paying for these indulgences. And so Luther came to the conclusion, and it's sort of at the heart of the Protestant faith, and if you think about even all the songs we sang today, right, about grace, It's the goodness of God. Like his conclusion was that we only came to faith through the grace of God, not by our own merit, not by anything that we've earned, but through the grace of God. And so as a result of that, if you're you're asking, what does that have to do with the book of Hebrews? Well, there were four books of the New Testament that Martin Luther considered to be disputed books. And what he meant by that was not even necessarily that we don't know who the author was, but that he didn't believe that they held the same weight of authority in the New Testament because they seem to not be preaching the same message as the rest of the New Testament. So he saw this message as being about grace alone and and, and by grace through faith, and then you would come to books like James, who would say faith without works is dead, and so he called James, uh, Martin Luther called it uh, an epistle of straw. Like he thought it was a straw man argument, basically, that it it was upheld only to be knocked down. And so he also viewed Hebrews as one of those books that he would say it's a disputed text. Like, it might be fine, it might be helpful, but it doesn't necessarily have the same weight of the rest of the authority in the New Testament. Now, it's worth noting that Martin Luther was also an anti-Semite, so there might be some of that going on. I don't like to drudge up the negative parts of people's personality, but it is the reality. We don't want to gloss over the negative aspects of their life. Uh, But I don't think that's why he rejected Hebrews. Um, I think he rejected Hebrews because it just seemed like it didn't fit. It it wasn't like a natural flow. Like any time, you know, there's, if you look at really long-running series of movies or film, you know, like the James Bond series or, you know, the Marvel Cinematic Universe or whatever, the Marvel movies, there's always like one or two that really avid fans of that series are going to say, that one doesn't fit. That's not part of the canon, right? Like, that's not, yes, that was a movie made by Marvel, but, like, Edward Norton's a clown, you know, or whatever it might be. So, you know, there's certain things that you go, these are not going to be, uh, and so that's what Martin Luther is doing. Now, I do think that Hebrews is a part of Scripture, okay? I'm not willing to go, I'm not willing to say, certainly, who am I? I'm not the Holy Spirit to say that Hebrews is not part of the authoritative canon of the New Testament. I believe that it is. But I will say to you that as we go into the book, you have to understand that there is a lot of the book that is going to make it sound that your faith 
can be earned through your merit. And if you don't know that going in, or you're not prepared for it, or you just read it, you know, just going in on like a cursory reading of it, you might walk away really confused because it doesn't naturally fit within the framework of everything else we talk about. Okay, you, ha you have to do some work. And you have to do some work in understanding what the book actually is, why it was written, how it was written, who it was written for, if you're going to really understand it. And so, you know, this is one of the reasons that I'm the introduction of just getting into the book, let alone the text we're going to read today is so long. Because if you don't understand some of this foundational information, you're going to be prone to misunderstanding Hebrews or just rejecting it outright. So let me give you a few more comments on the book of Hebrews, and then we'll get into the actual text we're going to be looking for today. Because unlike most of the other books in the New Testament, um, there's no author that takes credit for the book of Hebrews. In every other letter that we have uh, in the New Testament, the author identifies themselves right up front. Right? It'll, he'll, it'll say, like, Paul, an apostle to the Gentiles. And then it'll say who he's writing to. So it'll say, like, Paul, an apostle to the Gentiles, writing to the church in Ephesus. That was the standard way that you would open up a letter in the first century. And so a lot of people, even in some of your Bibles, it probably says and maybe calls this, like if you open up the Bible app on your phone or if you open up one of the Bibles in the pew, it would say and call this, title this book, the Epistle to the Hebrews or the Letter to the Hebrews. And, and, but it's not a letter. It just happens to be placed in the middle of the New Testament in a position where it, it's in the midst of all these letters. And so a lot of people have made the false assumption that it's a letter, but it's not a letter. And that actually matters um, because we don't know who the author is, and we don't really know who the audience is. We can surmise some things about them, but we don't know exactly. And, if you, and it makes it much more challenging to understand the book. You know, like even if somebody, you know, using this sermon as an example that I'm going to give today or any of the past sermons or, you know, Chris's sermon from past, sun, from past Sunday, if you want to know what that sermon means in the context, it would be really helpful to know that Chris Roberts was the author and that the church at Restore in Midland Park was the audience. Because then you could establish some context and some understanding of what might have been going on or what some people call the cultural encyclopedia, okay, the, the sayings that we all have in common. Um, and so you, it would be able to give you a little bit more context for understanding the letter itself. But we don't have any of that for Hebrews, so we have to take some educated guesses. So a few things you need to know. It's not a letter, but Hebrews is a sermon. Hebrews is written as a sermon. It, it's, it's literally written in order to bring an exhortation or a theme or an idea to a single people group. And that's one of the reasons, and now it's been written out, okay, but it's written out like an oral presentation. It's written out in order to be spoken to a group of people. So if you can imagine, any one of you right now with just even a little bit of uh, intonation in your voice, you know, a little bit of pausing, you know, some, some stage presence could come up here and read the words that are in my manuscript that's written out word for word, and you could feasibly deliver this sermon better than I could. You could come up and give an oral presentation of the sermon that I've written down, and it would be delivered better than I could, but you'd certainly get the main point of the sermon. And that's what was kind of intended with the letter, with this, book, this uh, sermon of Hebrews, was that it would be distributed to local churches and that they, it would be read aloud as a sermon. And one of the reasons that that's important is because the, when it's written, in much of the time, in the way that you would say something, not necessarily the way you would write it, if it was a letter, if it was a book. And I have people ask me this, all, not all the time, but occasionally someone will come up to me uh, after a sermon or after a presentation and say, hey, can I get a copy of your notes? You know, can I get your manuscript? And I'll send it to him, but I always say to him, just so you know, uh, you're going to read this and think he's not a very good author. Because the way that I use grammar when I'm speaking or the way that I even bend grammatical rules or the way that I pause when you're speaking, you don't do if you're writing it out as a book, but I'll write it. You know, there will be like certain code words in the manuscript that will indicate to me that this is where the pause is, or this is where the emphasis on the word is, or whatever. So a manuscript is different than something you were writing out if you were writing it for a book. So, and other times it's how you reference something, right? Like a few weeks ago, for example, I referenced Ron Swanson. Now, 
All I said was, as Ron Swanson would say, and then I gave the quote. Now, if you know who Ron Swanson is, you've got the joke. And if you didn't, it was just a throwaway line. But it was in a speech. It was an oral presentation. Um, but if I was writing that out in a book, I couldn't assume that my audience, whether now or, you know, God willing, let's say it was a book and 10 years from now people were still buying it, that 10 years from now people would have any, have any idea who that reference was. So I would go through and I would make, you know, I would describe a little bit more about who Ron Swanson is, that he's from the show Parks and Recreation, you know, that it was who, who created the show, um, you know, what his character was, and then I would describe maybe and get to the actual quote. But I would give a lot more context to it if I was writing it out in the form of a book. Well, the author of Hebrews does the same thing. Okay, he's going to drop references to the Old Testament and then just move on. He's going to say something at one point uh, about Esau, for example. But he's not going to give you any context of Esau's life. He's not going to explain the circumstances that he's referencing. He basically just says, don't be like Esau, and then moves on. And so you as the audience have to know, well, who the heck is Esau? What does it have to do with anything, right? And so if you're just reading Hebrews, it, has to, it takes a little bit more work to figure some of that stuff out. But it does lead us to two additional points that I hope are convicting for us. Okay, that Hebrews is a sermon. The next thing you need to know about the audience was that they were incredibly knowledgeable about Scripture. So even in the passage we're going to read today, he doesn't tell us, the author doesn't tell us where these biblical references come from. He's going to give us like maybe 10 Old Testament references, but he's not going to tell us where they come from. He's just going to say, you know what was said, or it was written, or this, but he doesn't tell us where he comes from. Now, part of it is because that wouldn't have made any sense to the first century uh, Christian, because in their Old Testament, they didn't have verse numbers, you know, they didn't have headings. Like, you couldn't say, you know, as it says in Isaiah 42, verse 11, they'd be like, that doesn't, what does that even mean? They would have known things uh, as it was, again, read, scripture was read to them. So they would have memorized it as an oral presentation. So that's part of the reason he delivers it that way. He goes, you know, you've heard that it was said, or it was said this, or here's what, what it was, and he just gives them the verse. But they knew it. They knew that scripture. They understood the meaning. They understood the context. And the second thing you need to know is that they were an afflicted people. Okay, the one thing we know of the audience of this sermon is that they were undergoing affliction. They're enduring some sort of suffering. Maybe they're experiencing frustration that things haven't gone better for them. Maybe they have had hoped that Jesus would have returned by now, and he hasn't. Uh, as a result, many of them are falling away from the faith. Many people are leaving the faith. They're walking away. And so the book of Hebrews, okay, this sermon is a sermon written to a group of people with knowledge of the Old Testament who were falling away from faith in Jesus Christ, and it's written to encourage them to endure, to endure in the faith despite their affliction. If you don't go into it understanding all of that stuff, all of that's an introduction on a Bible study. It's an introduction on how do you understand God's word? Because we're going to go into the text now, and I'm going to explain to you what I think it's saying. But my hope is that for you is what I never want and is that you would hear me preach on a text, and then you would go home and go like, well, only Jeremy can do that. You know, where you go home and you think, wow, because a lot of times you say, well, I didn't see that. You know, I've never seen that before. And my response is always like, well, I studied it for 15 to 20 hours this week. You didn't do that. You've probably never done that on any of the passages. That's what I'm doing. But what I want you to have is the tools so that you can actually go to Hebrews and understand it yourself. Because it's one of those books that we quote a lot. You know, there are a lot of quotations that come from the book of Hebrews, but we pull them out of context because we don't know. We don't know what's being said. We don't know who the audience is. We don't know who's being written to. So that's my long introduction to the text that we're going to read today and to the series. Let me read it to us. We're going to start right in Hebrews 1. Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our Father by the prophets. But in these last days, he spoke to us by his Son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature, and he upholds the universe by the word of his power. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much superior to angels as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. For to which of the angels did God ever say, you are my son, today I have begotten you? Or again, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. 
And again, when he brings the firstborn into the world, he says, let all God's angels worship him. Of the angels, he says, he makes his angels winds and his ministers a flame of fire. But of the Son, he says, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. The scepter of uprightness is the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness beyond your companions. And you, Lord, laid the foundation of the earth in the beginning, and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you remain. They will wear out like a garment. Like a robe, you will roll them up. Like a garment, they will be changed. But you are the same, and your years will have no end. And to which of the angels has he ever said, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet? Are they not all ministering spirits sent out to serve for the sake of those who are to inherit salvation? You know, like I said, it's not a letter. The preacher launches into his first point. He just begins. And the question is, where does he begin? He begins by establishing the supremacy of Christ. Everything else that the author, that the preacher is going to say is built on the supremacy of Christ. Every comparison he's going to make, every exhortation, every warning, every encouragement is built on what he says about Jesus Christ here who stands before, over, and in all things. And here is the question that he is begging his audience to ask. Who is Jesus? Who is Jesus? If you are just barely enduring, if you're struggling in your faith, if you are undergoing affliction, who is Jesus? Because your answer is going to change everything. Years ago, I had the pleasure of taking multiple ordination exams for the same reason. Uh, and something, someone asked a very interesting question that I've thought about often. And it was this. After all the theology and the practical questions and blah, 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 someone finally asked, who is Jesus to you? Not like, who is Jesus theologically? or what does scripture say about Jesus, but who is Jesus to you in this moment? How do you think about him? And we have to be honest with ourselves about the answer. See, at the time I said, I think of him as a friend. And that was true. But there have been other times in my life where if I'm being honest, I've thought of Jesus in more negative terms. Right, like I thought of Jesus as like a mean older brother. Or he was on some like mean spiritual guilt trip. You know, other times I've thought of Jesus as a conqueror maybe a comforter, maybe a father at times. It's not to say that what the Bible says about Jesus doesn't matter, because it does. It, 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 it infinitely does. But the point is it doesn't matter what the Bible says about Jesus if that truth is not true for you, if you haven't embraced that truth. Like things can be theologically and scripturally true of Jesus that you haven't embraced. So when you were to be asked the question, who is Jesus to you, your answer might not reflect what, what the author here has just described. And that's especially true for people enduring affliction. Everything the preacher says can be true and be completely irrelevant to you if you haven't embraced it. So what we're going to see as we ask this question, who is Jesus, the preacher is going to bring us on a progression from who Jesus is, what scripture says about him, and then what does that mean for you? Who is Jesus? Here's what he says in Hebrews 1. Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom he also created the world. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. And he upholds the universe by the word of his power. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much superior to angels as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. Uh, these first two sentences are the reason why I spent so much time on the introduction. The audience of this sermon is largely composed of Christian people who were raised in the Jewish faith. They may have had a Jewish background. They may have been Gentile Christians who spent a lot of time in the synagogue. It's the first century, mid-60s AD or so. They don't have the Old Testament. They just have the Bible, and the Bible is the Hebrew Scriptures. They may have had maybe 
access to one of the Gospels, maybe Mark, but they, and maybe they had had one of the letters that we have would have passed through, but for the most part, the scripture that they had was simply the Bible, the Old Testament, the Hebrew scriptures. That was their source of authority. That was the teaching they were studying. And so immediately, right off the bat, the author isn't just making a chronological comparison between what used to happen and what's happening now. He's making a comparison about authority, a declarative statement about the authoritative claims he's making. And he's saying, long ago, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets, but now he has spoken by his son. This is the authoritative declaration about everything he says. God used to speak through the prophets. Now he speaks through the, through the son, through the son. And what he's saying is, if you put your confidence in the prophets, how much more should you put your, pro- your confidence in the son? He goes on. Jesus is the heir of all things through whom he also created the world. In other words, Jesus is not only the source, but he's the recipient of all creation. The Son of God receives all things because the Son of God created all things. The preacher is saying that the Son is before, the Son is after. He's putting Jesus at the beginning of history and he's presenting him as the end purpose of history. He goes on. He is the radiance of the glory of God, the exact imprint of his nature, and he upholds the universe by the word of his power. What he's doing is saying, imagine all that God is, everything that scripture attests to, whatever you think about Yahweh, all of his glory, his radiance, and the exact imprint is found in Christ. All that God is was with us and among us. That's what we think about when we talk about Jesus. The Jesus who is very physically really down here among us, but remains with us and among us in the church. Not only was he right here, this God is with us, but he's upholding the very universe. He's not just at the beginning of time and at the end of time. He's above the cosmos and he's present among us. And so, among us, the author says, he makes purification of our sins. And as a result, he sits in the throne room of heavens, having a superiority that surpasses anything in all of the cosmos, including the angels. Who is Jesus? See, all of this can be theologically true, but completely irrelevant to you. Jesus stands before creation as its creator. Jesus stands after creation as the recipient of creation. Jesus stands above the cosmos as the one who's seated on the throne room of heaven and yet Jesus is very really among us. This is who Jesus is. Whatever else he's going to say about enduring affliction, whatever encouragement or warning he gives, does not matter at all. Unless you have embraced and believed that Jesus is the one who stands supreme over the universe, over the cosmos, over time, over space. Everything else hinges on that. But then he goes on and he uses scripture to justify it. Scripture testifies to the supremacy of Christ. And he's taking the very scripture that they've already studied and they already know. And he says, look, you already know this. Everything's already been established in scripture. And so reading this whole section, it's easy to remember that it's a sermon. So he's not providing them references. He's just saying things that they'd already know. Right? Like much the same as I might, you know, say something to you like, you know, we will never be separated from the love of Christ that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And you should know, and I would expect you to know, if you've been a Christian for any period of time, that that was a scriptural reference and that you should have some idea, hopefully, of where that came from. And you can go look it up. And then you would understand the context of it and all that. So that's what, that's what Paul is doing. Or that, I, If I say Paul, by the way, Paul is not the author of Hebrews. Okay? But if I say it, sometimes that's just what comes out. So anyway... Uh, but anyway, so they, you know, the people, they didn't even have access to the scriptures, right? Like there was a copy of the scripture in the synagogue, but they didn't personally have one the way that you had it in your home. And so they were memorizing it, right? Like they were listening to it, hearing it over and over and over. And so they were embracing the scripture. It was really living within them. And so God calls Jesus his son, but then not only does he say that God calls him a son, but then he says that, that God calls him his firstborn son. 
Part of the reason we're going into Hebrews right after having gone through Exodus is that some of these references should stick with you now that we've just gone through Exodus. Because if you remember, the idea of the firstborn in Exodus was huge, right? Like it, Pharaoh had to give up his firstborn son. God literally declares, you know, Yahweh declares to Pharaoh through Moses, uh, you have a choice. You can either give up your firstborn son or you can release my firstborn son. So the idea of the firstborn son is really relevant to them. And what he's doing, the author here, is he's wrapping up everything they would know from the Old Testament scriptures and saying all of this firstborn son stuff points towards and finds its fulfillment in Jesus. Everything that you know, all of this scripture that had meaning and had context was pointing forward to who Jesus is. He's wrapping up everything we know about the Hebrew story and seeing it finalized and carried through in the story of Jesus. In this firstborn, uh, God declares that even the angels will worship him. Angels are fleeting, but the son is eternal and forever. You know, the son's throne is forever. The son loves righteousness. And all of these scriptural quotations had an original interpretation, but now are being fulfilled in Christ. You know, Chris preached last week on um, the road to Emmaus. And these disciples who are really frustrated, you know, walking away from the death of Christ. And Jesus shows up. And they're kind of complaining. They don't know it's him. They're like, we had really high hopes for this guy. And what Jesus does, Luke summarizes his whole sermon in like two verses. One single sentence. In beginning with Moses and all the prophets, Jesus interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. I mean, talk about a manuscript you'd want to find. Right? Like, don't you wish that sermon was recorded somewhere? Well, the, ser the sermon to the Hebrews might be the closest we come. All scripture points to and finds its fulfillment in Jesus and testifies to who he is. Jesus is supreme over the cosmos. He's supreme over the angels. Scripture testifies to it. All of the Old Testament. And if we had more time, we could even go more deeply into each of the passages that he references, which I would encourage you to do on your own time because he's not, in many cases, not even just referencing a single passage, but he'll reference multiple passages and put them together as one quotation. But Scripture testifies to the supremacy of Christ. And we'll have so much more of an opportunity to dig into that throughout this series. But then the author concludes this opening section with a question for you to ponder. If Jesus is greater than the angels, then he says, this concluding sentence, then aren't the angels just ministering spirits sent out to those to, to serve those who are inheriting salvation. This is how he concludes the whole passage about Christ's supremacy, the scripture testifying to who he is. And he says, so if all of this is true, if God has declared him his son, his firstborn son, that all the angels are meant to minister to, then what are the angels up to these days? What are the angels doing? Firstborn son implies that there are other children. And so we consider in this question, what does it mean to endure in light of the supremacy of Christ? See, why does all this matter? Why does it matter that Jesus is supreme? Why does it matter that Scripture testifies to him? And this is his... This is how he wraps it up. Because if you understand that Jesus is supreme and you understand what Scripture says, then you will have the ability to endure in light of it all. If you answer this question, who is Jesus to you? We turn to the Scripture if we're under affliction. If we're tempted to walk away from the faith, maybe your passion for the faith isn't what it once was. Maybe you're growing tired or weary. You, know, you go through seasons of life where sometimes you feel like you're on fire for your faith, and other times you're like, I'm not renouncing it or anything. I'm still a Christian, but I'm bored. It's dull. Life's beating me up. Who is Jesus? We turn to the scripture. The author concludes with this. Is it, if it's true that Jesus is supreme, and he sits on the throne of all creation, if it's true that the very angels worship Jesus, 
then isn't it also true that the very angels who exist to serve Jesus also now exist to serve those who are Christ's? That those who are inheriting the salvation and the blessing that Jesus received. Like if you are now part of the same family of God, if you've been brought in because Jesus sits on the throne and he's like, these are my people, then his servants are serving you. What does it matter if you don't believe it? See, this is what Paul, this is what, I I almost said it again. This is what the author is saying. He's saying, Jesus is supreme. He's speaking to a people who are afflicted, a people who need to endure, a people who are walking from the place. He says, Jesus is supreme. He's greater than the angels. And as you endure affliction and you go through suffering and you go through these challenges, he has sent his angels to serve you. So no matter how hard a time you're having, no matter how difficult it is, whether you're living in first century Rome as these people probably were or whether you're living in Midland Park or northern New Jersey, he's saying Christ is supreme. Sits on the throne room of heaven before creation, after creation, above creation, within creation, and he sent his servants to minister to you. God has declared it through scripture, but he's saying something about you. He has given you salvation. He has declared you worthy, and so Jesus will not leave you alone. But whether or not that will lead you to endure requires you to answer this one question. Who is Jesus to you? That's the message of the gospel. Let's pray. Father, as we process this, this book, Lord, that there will be times where we find it dull, times where we find it just academic or studious, Father, may the, your word come through, your spirit, use it to uh, help us, to cause us to endure, to lead us to strengthen our faith, or at very least, Lord, a sense of confidence in knowing that you stand before, after, above, and within creation. Be with us, Lord, in your name.